<clears throat> from Luke chapter 10. And it's uh, verses 38 to 42, entitled At the Home of Martha and Mary. When I um, was training at Spurgeon's College, uh, the principal at Spurgeon's at that time was uh, a guy called the Reverend Dr. Nigel Wright. I, I thought he was a pretty good bloke, actually, Nigel. And um, uh, because I was quite a keen student, I don't know if you believe that or not, but uh, my mates actually um, uh, nicknamed me Son of Nigel <clears throat> because I was quite keen to, to, to learn. I don't know if it was tongue or cheek or not, but... Um, he, he brought out this book called Challenge to Change or New Baptist, New Agenda. I can't remember. I think it was New Baptist, New Agenda that he, um, he wrote and it was published whilst I was at college. And um, I got hold of one of these books and everybody was giving me a load of grief for getting <laughs> the principal's book. They thought that was just far too keen. So after, uh, during one of the coffee breaks, <clears throat> um, I, um, I just went, you know, to get a cup of tea or whatever. And, and whilst I was there, one of my mates grabbed hold of my book, went up to Nigel, who was lecturing us, and said, Dave's too shy. Um, Dave's too shy to ask. He, um, he, think, he thinks your book's amazing. It's great. Um, but he'd really like you to sign it, but he's too shy to ask. And so I come back from my cup of tea break, and I've got my drink, and then I come back to everyone's sniggering. Now, I know something's happened, do you know what I mean? And so they look at me, and they said, oh, just look in your book, not, not, we, we got Nigel to shine, sign it for you, do you know what I mean? And so uh, I didn't know what I was more annoyed about than going behind my back to get the book signed or the fact that Nigel thought that I thought it was wonderful. I didn't know which way to go on it. But um, he was pretty good, Nigel. And um, one of the things that I, there, there were a few things, I didn't have loads of lectures with him, but there were a few things along the way that he said that have stuck with me and continued to, um, stick with me. And, and one of the things he did share was, he said, as ministers, I, I really believe that we're called to be a non-anxious presence. He, he talked about Jesus in the boat when the storm was kicking off and everything like that. And, and, and the disciples were in panic mode. Teacher, don't you care if we, we drown? And, and, and Jesus is asleep in the boat, isn't he? Does he not care? And actually, Nigel says, actually, it's a picture of perfect peace that God is in control. And, and, and he said that Jesus is the non-anxious presence in the boat. And he said, actually, the pattern of ministry, if there's any basis for ministry, if there's any basis for, for service, it is completely patterned by God that, that what I do, what we do in ministry and in service is always patterned by Jesus. And therefore, if Jesus is the non-anxious presence in the boat, so should we be. And I sat there and I started thinking, how, how on earth can I be that? <laughs> do you know what I mean? I was like, I was thinking that is a massive high bar. Do you know what I mean? When it's all kicking off, how on earth can we be a non-anxious presence? But Jesus says, do not worry, doesn't he? Do not worry about the things you can't control. And so at the start of this year, I was reflecting upon that. And I was just thinking of some passages that we could be drawn to that speak about the non-anxious presence. In other words... The task is, how can we be filled with the peace of Jesus, the Prince of Peace? How can our lives be so impacted by the Prince of Peace that we can be agents of peace and non-anxiety to those around us? That's quite a challenge, isn't it? And so, why don't we turn to Luke chapter 10. This little mini-series is called The Non-Anxious Presence of Jesus, the non-anxious presence of Jesus. Verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way home, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. 
But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken away from her. Just one thing is needed. It will not be taken away from her. We give thanks to God for his amazing word. Do you know, um, as is already mentioned, <coughs> uh, we've been here seven years as a family. Just before, in the time between our previous church at Pembury and here, uh, in between times, as a family, uh, Amanda, Hannah and John T and I, we went to Amsterdam on a little short break before we started here. It was just before Christmas. And one of my heroes of the faith, uh, someone who really inspires me so, so much, is <coughs> Corrie and Betsy Ten Boom. And the clock shop um, and their residence is just a short drive or just a short journey on the train outside of, of, of Amsterdam. And so when we were going to Amsterdam, I said to Amanda and the family, I said, I really want to go to the house of Corrie and Betsy Ten Boom. For those of you who don't know them, I know that many of you would be super familiar <coughs> with them, but um, uh, Corrie and Betsy belonged to a family. Uh, their father was a watchmaker. It was a watchmaker's shop um, in Arnhem where they were. And, uh, and they were godly Lutheran family who during the Second World War was so moved by the way that the Nazis were treating the Jewish community that they took it upon themselves that they would help anyone who would come and knock on their door and give them support. And, and they supported and hid many, many Dutch Jews and were part of the Dutch resistance uh, organization. They were incredible and it was at great cost that, um, that they hid the Jewish people and helped them to escape because eventually a knock did come at the door and it was the Gestapo and they were arrested. And so they were taken to a concentration camp at Ravensbrück. And uh, one of the things that really strikes me about them is just their trust and their faith in Jesus um, at a time when it was just absolutely desperate. As they were queuing to go into Ravensbrück, as they were queuing to be processed, Betsy knew that she'd got in her hand a little Bible and she prayed. She said, Lord, look, I really, really would like to be able to get this Bible into the concentration camp with me. It's going to be impossible, but I really don't want to let go of my Bible. And so uh, as she was in the queue, um, Betsy it was such a slow moving queue that Betsy needed the toilet. And she said to one of the guards, can I go to the toilet? The guard pointed her in this particular direction. And when she got to the toilets, she realized that the, the lavatory was actually positioned in a way that you could access it um, beyond the checkpoint as well as before the checkpoint. And so she realized that she could get access to this toilet once she'd been processed. So she got her Bible and she stuffed it in some blankets that were in the corner of those toilets. And then when she was processed, she then had her prison uniform, went back to the toilets, got changed into her uniform and relocated her Bible. And so her Bible was with her as she entered the concentration camp. And she was so, so thankful. And every evening, Corrie and Betsy, after their hard labor during the daytime, would go back to the barracks just a little bit like what we see here. And as they went back, they would they would open their Bible in the darkest of places, the most difficult of circumstances, and they would open their Bibles and they would study their Bibles. On one particular occasion, they came across the verse 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18, which says, Rejoice always, 
pray continually. And then these difficult words, give thanks in all circumstances. And Corrie and Betsy, or Corrie looked at Betsy and she was like going, how on earth can we give thanks in this circumstance? What on earth have we got to give thanks for in our current situation? And Betsy was like, well, we, we may not feel like giving thanks, but there's always something we can give thanks for. We, we, we need to practice this verse. It's, this is God's word. We need to stand on it. What can we give thanks for? And so sort of reluctantly, Corrie got involved. And one of the first things uh, Corrie said, well, I am thankful that we're together. I'm thankful that we haven't been separated. And Betsy said, yes, this place is unimaginable. It would only be more unimaginable if I wasn't with you in this place. And then, and then they said, we also give thanks for the way that God enabled us to, to get the Bible in here. It's a source of great encouragement to us. And they, they gave thanks. And then they gave thanks for another few things. And then Betsy seemed to go off piste. She says, do you know what? I think we should even give thanks to God for the fleas. And these barracks were absolutely infested with fleas. And by this point, Corrie was like going, come on, Betsy. I mean, I've come a long way with you. I've given thanks to God for lots of things. Why do I have to give thanks? How can we possibly give thanks to God for the fleas? Can't give thanks to God for the fleas. She said, they're part of God's creation. Let's give thanks to God for the fleas. So they did. Anyway, I think Corrie thought Betsy had lost the plot. Anyway, a few weeks later, an awful fight. Um, well, one of the things was every night when they were in that barracks, they prayed, they took hold of the Bible. And the more that they prayed and the more they read the Bible, the more the people in that crowded barracks began to ask for prayer requests. And at night with a little candle and the Bible, prayer requests were being passed from the barracks. And every night it became a live prayer meeting for sometimes up to two, three hours. People were praying and being ministered to, verses were being shared and prayers were being said. And and, and Betsy couldn't understand why the guards never came in the barracks, why the prayer meetings could last for such a long time, why they were never interrupted. Anyway, a few weeks later, they got their answer because a massive fight broke out in the barracks and it was like a proper sort of kick lumps out of each other kind of fight. It, was, it got quite scary to the point where Betsy rushed out of the barracks and went to the guards are you not going to come in and stop this? They're, they're killing each other in there. At which point the guard said, no way. I am not going in there. And Betsy said, why not? They're, they're killing each other. Why not? She said, I'm not going. None of us go in there because of the fleas. I am not going in there because of the fleas. And at that point, Betsy knew. And she really gave thanks to God for the fleas because she knew the reason why every night they were able to have such powerful prayer meetings, why they were able to, to worship God and, and, and share verses and pray for each other it freely and without interruption was because the guards never went in there because of the fleas. And Betsy said to Corrie, you know, we did need to give thanks to God for those fleas because he has given us space. You know, that place, that barracks, however desperate it was, it actually became a house of prayer. It actually became a place of God's presence. And I want to talk about the presence of God. I want to talk about dwelling in the presence. Look at, look at our study together. When we think about anxiety, we're going to see that the antidote to that is actually the presence of God. Look at our study today. Jesus was physically present in this house. He was actually in the home of Mary and Martha. Look at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary 
who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. A woman named Martha, and what did she do? She opened her home to him. It's like a, a precious moment. It's like, the, it's like the physical version of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This story of Mary and Martha is like a physical version of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus is literally at the door of Mary and Martha's house. And what does, Mary, Mar, what does Martha do? She opens the door and invites Jesus in. This place, this house, suddenly has become the dwelling place of God. It's a dwelling place. The presence of God is there. That's the link. It doesn't matter if it's Ravensbrück, or it doesn't matter if it's Mary and Martha's house. It doesn't matter if it's a, a, a spiritual verse in Revelation 3.20. If you open the door and Jesus comes in, that becomes a dwelling place. He is literally in their house. It's not a moment. It's not a moment that you want to miss. So the passage then poses a question. If this passage is about the dwelling place of Jesus, if this is about the presence of Jesus, the question that this passage gives us is how do we react to this? How do we respond to the presence of Jesus? And there are, there are two things that are really clear that come forward in this passage. Two simple things. First of all, it's so easy to be distracted, isn't it? It's so easy even if Jesus is in the house. And, and, and we believe, Scripture says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there Jesus is in the midst. And so very much right at this moment, as we have gathered in the name of Jesus today, Jesus is here. Jesus is right here, right now. And what we see in the passages is that even though a house might have the dwelling might be the dwelling place of Jesus, it's really, really, really easy to be distracted. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. The, the Greek word there for distraction is perisparto. Perisparto. And, and that word perisparto when it was used, it was always used in the connotation of a person being pulled and dragged in different directions. It's like, it's like Martha was being pulled in, in every different way, pulled in different directions. In fact, some of the reason why Martha was being torn away from the presence of Jesus rather than towards the presence of Jesus uh, was, was because of cultural expectations. Culturally, hospitality was really important in that culture. You had to honor your guest. And when you've got such an important guest as Jesus arriving at your door, suddenly Martha is finding the pressure to produce. This has got to be perfect. This has got to be good enough. And, and, and she's feeling that pressure. Maybe she was finding her, her self-value and her self-worth in, in what she could do for Jesus rather than just being with Jesus. Not only um, was she under pressure to perform in that moment, or she was, putting, she was perceiving that pressure, um, there was also another cultural uh, expectation that was getting right up her nose at that moment, and that was her sister Mary. You see, the expected role of the woman in that culture was to prepare the meal, whereas the posture of a student learning at the feet of the rabbi was traditionally a role reserved for men. And so, and so not only is Martha feeling the pressure of expectation upon her, She's also getting really annoyed with her sister, who 
is going against cultural expectations. And so, was her anxiety in that situation felt because she was trying to meet the expectations of others? Do you know, whatever was going on, whatever was pulling her in different directions, what we see is the outcome of uh, the outcome of everything going on there was two different kind of problems. First of all, whatever was going on, Mary, Martha wasn't able to enjoy the presence of Jesus. In her busyness and in her distraction, she'd actually lost sight of her guest. That was the irony. She, she wanted the hospitality to be perfect. She wanted to do such a good job. But in, in all her focus, in all her busyness, in all her hopes, she'd actually lost sight of the guest. And so there's a distancing here. Jesus wasn't looking for perfection at all. Jesus was just looking for relationship. So the busyness was a distraction. But there was a second dimension. Not only was the busyness affecting her relationship with Jesus, but also the distraction was affecting her relationships with the other people in the house. Martha's anxiety was leading to tension. It was creating tension. Her response was affecting the whole environment. Verse 40, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. What we see is that there's actually an outflow of Martha's anxiety. Martha's anxiety then leads to critical words. Martha is critical of Mary. And not only does it, it, it doesn't just stop at the negative criticism, it then moves towards resentment. And then once it moves to resentment, she actually embarrasses Mary in front of Jesus, which was against the social etiquette. You don't embarrass people in front of your guest. She tries to get Jesus to take her side. And so what we see here is that the anxiety that she's facing and the distraction doesn't just affect her relationship with Jesus, it affects her relationship with others. There's a bad flow. Anxiety leads to criticism and affects the whole house. And Martha's criticism actually has a distancing effect on, on all her relationships. I read this week, Martha's worry and distraction prevent her from being truly present with Jesus and cause her to drive a wedge between her sister and herself and between Jesus and herself. Unfortunately, folks, that's what anxiety does. That's what it does. It creates a tension around us. And so, how does Jesus respond? I love the response of Jesus. Verse 42, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Jesus says, look, just one thing is needed, Martha. You, you don't need to be stressed here. You don't need to be pulled in all these different directions. You don't have to be perfect. Just one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. Do you know, we just need in our lives to pause. It, it's really hard to take on the role of being the non-anxious presence. Because so often the anxiety is uncontrollable in our lives. We know that worry doesn't make a difference. It doesn't add a single hour to our day. The antidote, just one thing is needed we just need to sit 
at the feet of Jesus. Sometimes we need to inhale as well as exhale. We need the presence of Jesus. We need the calmness of Jesus. We need the stillness of Jesus. Sometimes we just need to take a deep breath. Martha, the world's not going to fall apart. We'll have a lovely meal here today. Just, just relax. Just, just, just rest in the presence of Jesus. Jesus is in the house. Don't let all this anxiety distance yourself from me or from others. Just come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, as we come to the conclusion of this passage, and it's just an introduction to sort of the antidote to anxiety, really. Um, in many ways, this story is left unresolved and suspended. We, we don't know certain questions about it. Were Mary and Martha reconciled? Was Martha able to actually enjoy her guest? Was she able to give Jesus her full attention? But I like the fact that the story le is left open-ended because this is where we kind of step in to the story. This is where the story asks us questions. And so as the story is left open, let us step in. Are we distracted? Are we feeling like we're being pulled in different directions? Have we lost sight of Jesus in all the busyness, in all the expectations around us? In the chaos, have we become anxious? Are, are we critical? And has that distanced ourselves from others? In all of this chaos in the house, Jesus says, just one thing is needed. That's what, he, that's what I think he would say to us. Just one thing is needed. And so I just simply have an encouragement at the start of this year, which is this, come and sit. Jesus is in this house. In fact, Jesus is in your house. Jesus is in your heart. And I just know that whatever goes on this year, most of us will be stressed. Most of us will be anxious. Most of us will feel a long way away from that non-anxious presence. But I think the encouragement of Jesus, the, the invitation of Jesus is this. Look, find space to sit with me. Because that is what's needed. Amen. So I just really encourage you, not not put any guilt or condemnation on any of us. There is times when we do feel pulled in different directions, but Jesus gives us the answer. Just one thing is needed. Perhaps this year we can learn to inhale as well as exhale. Let's pray together. Let's pray.